5, 22 and 23 says, But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. And then Ephesians chapter 6, for the sake of time, I'm not going to read the whole passage, but it's talking about the whole armor of God. And if, you, uh, if you're there, but you're not, you're, I didn't tell you to turn there, but uh, verse 16 says, Above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. That means if you can't take any other piece of the armor of God, the most important piece is taking the shield of faith. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for this day. Lord, I pray that you would give me the words to say. Please just put me aside, Father, and speak to the congregation this morning. Lord, I pray that you would just um, fill me with the Holy Spirit, Lord, and uh, help uh, them to ha- the congregation to have open hearts and open minds, Father, to receive what you have for them this morning. I pray and ask all this in Jesus Christ's name. Uh, like I said, it's not something new, uh, but faith is important for our Christians, for, for ourselves, for a Christian life, for a Christian walk. It's, it's foundational, right? Uh, uh, it's, all, it's a part of everything that is about being a Christian. There in Galatians and Ephesians, you know, two great passages that talk about Christian growth. Faith is mentioned in both. Uh, if you would, look at Hebrews 11, and we'll start in verse 1. It says, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. For by it the elders obtained a good report. Through faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God so that things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. Faith is the process of us trusting God in what we do in what we believe, and in what we hope. That's what faith is. Uh, there we, say, we can read how God says that through faith, we understand that creation was made by God. If you were to look outside and you look at nature and you look at, at the heavens and the, the, the planets and, and the complexity of the human body, the human eye alone, how it all works, I can't understand. I've looked at it. I don't understand how it works. But God knows, right? You can't look at it all and say, well, it just happened. It just big bang, uh, you know, some, some mud started to move and, and something came out of it. No, that's not true. It's ingrained in man to, to know that there's a creator. And it says through faith, we understand that that creator is Jesus Christ. That's what faith is. But why do we need faith? Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 says, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. First, you need faith for salvation. It's impossible to be saved without faith. There's no amount of prayers you can pray. There's no amount of money you can give to anybody. There's no amount of good works you can do. There's no amount of uh, doing good and outweighing the bad. The only way for salvation, the only way to escape the punishment for your sin, which is hell, the only way is through faith in Jesus Christ and faith in Jesus Christ alone. It's nothing we can do. It's what Jesus did. Jesus did it already. You just have to receive that. You have to believe that. It's like a gift. If I were to try and give you my Bible, I'm holding it out to you. It's like Jesus holding out salvation. And if you don't take it, it's not yours. That taking and receiving, believing, that's faith. That's what's important for salvation. You need to have faith in Jesus Christ. That is the only way that you can be saved. Secondly, you need faith for security. Ephesians 6.16 Above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. From the moment you get saved, and even before you get saved, the devil is going to hurl fiery darts at you. He's going to tell you that, that you 
aren't saved, that God really didn't die for you, that, that you're too bad to be saved, that God doesn't want you to get saved, that God can't use you, that God doesn't want you, that, that God can't forgive you, that God doesn't have the power to forgive you. The devil is going to hurl fiery darts at you, and you're going to need your faith to block those darts. You need that shield of faith. You need faith in, in the promises of God. God's word says that, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Not that you might, not that you could, not that and if you do this too, you'll be saved. No. You shall be saved if you call the name of the Lord. Thirdly, you need faith for service. Look at verse 6 in Hebrews 11. It says, But without faith... It is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. I don't know about you, but when I get to heaven someday, I, want, um, I pray and hope that I hear, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. I want to uh, please God. I pray that that's your prayer, that you want to please God. If you want to please God, it's faith. You can only do it through faith. It says, without faith, it is impossible to please God. Fourthly, you need faith for surrender. Romans 12, 1 and 2. If you're here for Sunday school, I went over these verses, but Romans 12, 1 and 2 says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Amen. Paul, I said this this morning, Paul is beseeching us to present our bodies a living sacrifice unto God. That means surrender. That means you giving your life to God, for God, to be used by God, to fulfill God's will, not your will. If you want to do that, it's going to take a lot of faith. And it's going to, you're going to have trying times, you're going to have times where you doubt it, and you're going to have times where, where you go back on it. But if you want to be used and you want to live your life for Christ, it's going to take faith. One of the things that I think God uses faith for, uh, Romans Chapter 1, if you would real quick, keep your place in Hebrews 11. Look at Romans chapter 1, and I believe it's verse 17. We're called the light of the world, right? Where Jesus is called the way, the truth, and the life, and, and he's, called the, he's called the light, right? Jesus, if you were to look, uh, we're called the bride of Christ, which is a resemblance of the moon. And what does the moon do? At night, it reflects the light that the sun gives it, right? That's what our job is, to take the light of God, the light of Jesus Christ, and let it shine forth out of us to the lost, right? To the dark world, right? And so I think that's done through faith. Look at Hebrews, or sorry, Romans chapter 12, sorry, Romans chapter 1 uh, and verse 17 says, For therein is the righteousness of God revealed. Right? Our job is to show the lost, to show the world Jesus Christ. Verse 17, For therein is the righteousness of God revealed, from faith to faith. As it is written, the just shall live by faith. I believe that what we call our testimony, what we call our example, is our faith, right? That's what your testimony is, is how how you came to know, how you came to have faith, and how that faith has grown you, and how that faith has, you've been able to be used of God. That faith, from your faith, to someone else's faith. Our faith, our testimony, is how we let the light of Jesus Christ shine through our life. And how do we do that? Well, that's what Hebrews 11 is all about, is how we today can show the dark world, the lost world, our faith. If you would, look at verse, uh, verse 4. It says, By faith Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, 
by which he obtained witness that he was righteous, God testifying of his gifts, and by it being dead, yet speaketh. The first thing that we can, how we can show the world our faith is in what we sacrifice, right? I think there's lots of different things we can sacrifice today for, for God. I think there's three major things that Christians are unwilling to sacrifice or reluctant to sacrifice. The first is our time. Today, the world pulls at our time in so many different directions, right? We, we don't have time to, to get up in the morning and read our Bible. We don't have time to spend an hour or 15 minutes even or five minutes even in prayer sometimes with God. We don't have time to, maybe we have time to come to church on Sunday morning, but we don't have time for Sunday night. Or, or maybe we have time for Sunday morning and Sunday night, but not Wednesday. Or maybe we have time for all three services, but we don't have time for visitation. We don't have time for door knocking. We don't have time to study for the Sunday school class we have. Today, we don't want to give our time to God. We have precious little time, and yet we don't want to sacrifice it for God. We don't want to say, hey, maybe I don't have to watch that football game. Or, hey, maybe I don't have to go play a game of golf. Or, hey, maybe I can let the dishes sit there for another five minutes while I pray. Or, hey, maybe I can, that project can wait and I can spend a little time in, in God's Word. There's so many things that are pulling at our time, right? Ourselves, the world, and the, and, and the devil, they're all taking as much time as they can so we don't have time for God. We need to set time aside for God. We need to sacrifice some of our, our personal time and give it to God. Second thing I think we need to learn to sacrifice more of is our finances. Today we're told to, to earn as much money as you can and to put it in retirement and invest it and buy a nice house and, and have a nice car and, and, and the money you earned, you, spent, you, you, you worked so hard for it, it's your money. No, it's God's money. God's given you the ability to work. God's given you the skill set to have a nice job. God's given you the, the money. First give him the 10% and, and give to missions and then sacrifice and give some more. Now, it's hard for a missionary to say to, to give more money, but I can guarantee you that, that there's no ministry that says, oh, no, sorry, I, I have enough money. No, I don't need any more, yeah. right? I guarantee you that, I don't know the church's finances at all, but I guarantee you that they could use more money for a certain ministry. I guarantee you they could use money for certain things. But no, we earned it. I earned it. I want it. It's my money. I need to... I need to save for retirement. And I'm not saying saving for retirement is a bad thing. God wants us to be faithful stewards and, and to, to save our money for when we need it. But when God works in your heart to give, and He does, God's worked in my heart to give many times, and we say, well, I, I have that money saved for something else. Sorry, God. Well, uh, they don't really need it. Well, I mean, the church really doesn't need the money. It's not about the money. It's about the reluctance to sacrifice for God. If you look at, and I think it's in one of the, I can't remember the passage, in one of the Gospels, God talks about the widow giving two mites and how she gave more than anybody. And yet it was two mites, essentially two pennies. And she gave everything. To God, it's not about how much you give. It's about what is in the way between you and God. Is the money in the way between you and God? Well, maybe you need to sacrifice it for God. The, four, or the third thing that I think Christians are unwilling to sacrifice, and this is where it comes to missions, is our comfort zone. It is comfortable to be a Christian in the United States today. It's comfortable to sit in a, in a heated or an air-conditioned building it's comfortable to sit in a, in a padded pew or, or a chair and, and to have nice carpet and to, to have nice lights and a nice sound system. And again, I'm not saying the things are bad. What I'm saying is when you're in it, you're comfortable in it, and when God calls you to maybe go somewhere else where it's not so comfortable, how many times have Christians said, no, that's not for me, that's too hard of a life? No, God really doesn't. God wouldn't call me to be a missionary in Africa. I mean, 
<laughs> have you seen what they eat? Have you seen the mud floors? <laughs> God doesn't want me to do that. Yeah. Not only that, but maybe your comfort zone is talking to somebody about Jesus. I tell you, the first time I preached in front of a, a larger group than 15, 16 people is uh, at Bible college. You had watch night service, which is New Year's Eve. You had to preach in front of five to 600 people. And you didn't know if you were going to get called, and so you had to be ready to preach, and you sat there, and you waited, and waited, and waited. And I was so nervous, and I remember it was getting close to midnight, and I thought, okay, they're going to call one more preacher, and it's not going to be me. They're not going to call me last, so I'm good. I don't have to preach. Woo! Praise the Lord. <laughs> and someone said, oh, wait, you haven't called on Brother Coleman yet. Oh, yeah, Brother Coleman, go ahead and go preach. And I got up there, and, and I gripped the pulpit. I'm going to turn that that way. I gripped the pulpit, and I laid in, and I said, um, open your Bibles to Romans. <laughs> I said, um, probably 50 or 60 times in 10-minute message. <laughs> I was so nervous. I'm nervous right now. Anytime I get up to, to preach and to stand in front of people is out of my comfort zone. I don't like, I, I get nervous. My, my palms get sweaty. I start to sweat everywhere. My mouth gets dry. But God wants to use you. And a lot of times, the only way he can use you is when you're away from comfort. Oh, out of yourself. I said that this morning. When, when, you, when you've reached your limit, God has to step in and carry you further, and that's when God gets the glory. And many people today don't want to sacrifice that comfort for God. Missions, I said it again this morning, but missions, if you were to look at missions as a battlefield, right? As a battlefield. We are giving up ground. Not that we're losing the battle, but we are giving up ground. And instead of reaching more and more countries, reaching more and more people, we're reaching fewer and fewer countries. Fewer and fewer people. Fewer and fewer cities. Fewer and fewer villages. I think one of the reasons is because we don't want to sacrifice our comforts for God. Next is our, is our hope. We can show the lost our faith in our hope. Look at verse uh, 5 and 6. By faith Enoch was translated that he should not see death and was not found, because God had translated him. For by, before his translation, he had this testimony that he pleased God. Enoch was translated, right? He was, he was taken away so that he would never die, right? What is your biggest hope today, Christian? Your biggest hope should be in the rapture. Your biggest hope should be in the return of Jesus Christ. Amen. Do your lost loved ones, do your lost friends, do your lost family members, do your lost neighbors know that that's your biggest hope? Or do they think your biggest hope is a healthy family, a nice house and a nice car, or a good paying job, the bills to win the Super Bowl? Right? What, what's your biggest hope? The lost ought to know that your biggest hope is in Jesus Christ's return. You're, the lost ought to know that, that when you wake up in the morning, you're hoping that we hear that trumpet and see the clouds part. Right? That speaks volumes when that's your biggest hope. Thirdly, look at verse 7. By faith, Noah, being warned of God of things not seen as yet, moved with fear, prepared an ark to the saving of his house, by the which he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness which is by faith. We can show the lost our faith in God and Jesus Christ by what we fear. You know, it took Noah up to 120 years to build the ark. I just turned 30, not 42. <laughs> I just turned 30, and I can't imagine doing the same thing day in, day out, over and over and over for 120 years. Tree after tree after tree, 
you know, chopping the tree down, spending all day taking that one tree to the build site, spending that whole week carving all the bark off the tree, spending the next month carving that tree into plank after plank after plank, and then going and gathering all the supplies that you need for 120 years doing the same thing. And why? Because he feared what God said. Because he had faith in, in what God said was going to happen, was going to happen. Not only that, but Noah is called a preacher of righteousness. So not only did he spend all that time doing all that work to build an ark, to, to prepare him and his family for something that had never happened, that seemed outlandish and, and, and seemed like a fairy tale, but the whole time, he's saying, get saved today before it's too late. Something's going to happen that's never happened before. Right? The whole time, he's telling the lost, hey, there's judgment coming. Hey, there, you need to get right. Something is going to happen that is going to change the world. And your only hope is in God. Do we have that fear? Do we have the fear of the judgment that's coming for the lost? Do you tell the lost about God's judgment? Do you tell your family and your friends and your coworkers and your neighbors and, and the acquaintance and the person at the, at the grocery store and the gas uh, attendant? And do you tell them about the judgment that's coming? The, the not only the eternal judgment, but the immediate judgment, the great tribulation. Man, I, I don't hope that on anybody. The pain and the misery and the, the death and the, the, the awfulness of everything that's going to happen during the tribulation, I don't wish that on anybody. And yet if they don't get saved, they're going to go through it. And many of them are going to die in it. Are you moved with fear? for their eternal salvation, that it compels you to tell others of Jesus? Not only that, but are you moved with the fear of God, ju God's judgment in your life? You know, God's word says that if you sow corruption, that your flesh is going to reap the rewards of that corruption. We ought to be moved by fear, and God is merciful, and God's long-suffering, God's gracious, and Praise the Lord for it, but God's mercy and, and grace, there is judgment. Someday, if you keep sinning and you keep doing the same thing, God's going to bring the judgment on your flesh. And we ought to be moved by fear, and, and so much so that it compels us to live a righteous life. Then we can show the lost our faith in our daily walk. Abraham, look at verse 8. Verse 8 says, By faith, Abraham, when he was called to go out into a place which he should receive, after receive for inheritance, obeyed, and he went out not knowing whether he went. It says, by faith, Abraham, right? He was told to, to go somewhere where he didn't know where he was going. He didn't know the roadblocks that were going to be in the way. He didn't know the, the valleys that were going to be, that he had to cross, and the, the valleys and the rivers and the, the obstacles that were in the way. He had no idea. God said, take a step by faith and take the next step by faith and the next step, not knowing what's ahead. Today, I, and I, this is how I am. I like to know... What's ahead? <laughs> I like to know where I'm going to sleep. I like to know what we're going to eat. I like to know, uh, to, to know, you know, okay, what are the obstacles that I'm going to have? What are the challenges that are going to be ahead of me here? That's not how God works a lot of the time. <laughs> Sadly, that's not how God works. God says, hey, now, I say this, I show you this, but this is not really it's not blindly. It's not, oh, I don't know where I'm going. I don't know, you know, am I going to step off? No. No, God says, hey, look, right there. Don't worry about down there. Look right there. That's where I want you to step, right there. And take that step by faith. And you know what? Maybe the rest of it's cloudy. Maybe the rest of it you can't see. But God says, look, it's a little step. It's just a little one. 
Take that next step. And take the next one, and the next one, and the next one, and before long, you'll be amazed where God takes you. You'll be amazed what God lets you do and what God lets you be a part of. Only walk by faith, like Abraham. Then Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph, you can read in verse 20 to 22 how they preached and they prophesied by faith. If you want to preach God's word by faith, it's... You got to study it first. You got to know what's in here. That means spending time in God's Word. That means memorizing God's Word. Knowing what's in here so that you have faith in that when you're preaching and you're proclaiming truth, you actually believe it. Because if you don't, I guarantee you the lost ain't going to believe it. Then 20, verse 23 down to 31, you can read how Moses. Uh, and, and others, how they did specific actions by faith. They did specific things by faith. All the way down to, um, excuse me, all the way down to uh, verse 30 says, By faith the walls of Jericho fell down, that, uh, that they were compassed about seven days. By faith the harlot Rahab received, uh, uh, perished not with them that believed not when she had received the spies with peace. Great accomplishments were done by faith. Look at verse 32. And what shall I more say? For the time would fail me to tell of, and that's, that time would fail me to go through everything that God's done, right? I could sit here for weeks and weeks and weeks and tell you what God accomplished because of someone's faith. It says, of Gideon, and of Barak, and of Samson, and of Jephthah, and of David also, and Samuel, and of the prophets, who through faith subdued kingdoms, wrought righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the violence of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, out of weakness were made strong, waxed valiant in fight, turned to flight the armies of the aliens, Women received their dead, raised to life again, and others were tortured, not accepting deliverance, they, uh, that they may obtain a better resurrection. And others had trial of cruel mockings and scourgings, yea, moreover, of bonds and imprisonment. They were stoned, they were sawn asunder, who were tempted, were slain with the sword. They wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, tormented, of whom the world was not worthy." They wandered in deserts and in mountains and in dens and caves of the earth. And all these, having obtained a good report through faith, received not the promise. God, having provided some better thing for us, that they without us should not be made perfect. Great things. I said time would fail me to go over it all of what God accomplished through Someone's faith it says there, but they receive not the promise. That promise is Jesus Christ. If you're saved in here today, you have received that promise. I hope to God someday that we get to recount the Hebrews chapter 11 for the church age. The great victories and the, the miracles and the, the, the great things that God accomplished because of someone's faith. Will your faith be written in that chapter? Will your accomplishments be mentioned? The last part of that passage, it talks about maybe suffering some things. Maybe going through some things. In 2 Corinthians chapter 11, you can read how Paul lived a life in peril. Peril means in danger of losing your life. Paul lived a life in peril because of his faith. Maybe God wants you to live a life of peril for your faith. Maybe that's how God can get the most glory out of your life. But being comfortable in a pew and in a chair in the U.S. is compelling. It's, it draws us, right? Mm -hmm. 
Maybe how you can show the lost the most faith is by going through something for God. Having a tribulation for God. I don't know if you've ever heard of a missionary named Charles Wesco. He was a missionary to Cameroon, Africa. He uh, had nine children and he uh, went on deputation, raised his support. And about, I think it took about two years, about a year and a half into that, where he was headed in Cameroon, civil unrest started. Cameroon is divided into ten states. Uh, there's eight French-speaking states and two English-speaking states. And he was headed to the English-speaking. Well, the English-speaking states wanted to declare their independence from the French, and the French don't want him to. So essentially a civil war. Well, for six months he prayed and fasted and asked counsel from many different people and said, hey, should I go? I shouldn't I go? Should I go to the French side? I feel like God wants me to still go to where he, he called me to. Many people said, no, don't go. You'd be foolish to go. Don't put your life in danger, your kids' lives, you know, your wife's life in danger. God wouldn't call you to, to, to be in danger. God wouldn't do that to you. Some men counseled and said, hey, we're not the Holy Ghost. If God's working and God is calling you to go there, I'm not going to be in the way. You obey God. And I, he prayed and he still felt like God wanted him to go. So much so that he made a video for his children that basically said, hey, if I die on the foreign field, if I die in Cameroon, don't blame God. It's because God wanted me to die. I have no doubt that God has called us to be missionaries to Cameroon and Cameroon now. Right? He got there. Two weeks in country. He was on his way to fix something with his passport. He was in the passenger seat. Another missionary was driving. Their two wives were behind them. And Charles Wesco's son was in the middle seat in the back. They hit a roadblock. Someone stepped out of the woods with a shotgun and killed him. One shot. Two weeks in country. How many of those people that counseled him to not go said, Ah, we told him he shouldn't have gone. Now he just traumatized his wife, traumatized his son. Who knows if they'll make it out alive. He's dead. What a waste. What, God didn't want to do that. He was ready to die. He was ready to make the ultimate sacrifice for God because he had faith and God said, hey, I want you to go there to reach the Cameroonians. He had faith that, okay, I'm going to go obey God. When the body came to the morgue that day, basically from being shot, the police came, investigated it, and they took the body to the morgue, the whole, everybody that was there. The, the mortician was, to save, was a saved Cameroonian. He got on his knees in front of Charles Wesco's son and said, Son, you have no idea the sacrifice your, God, your, your dad just made, how much that's going to impact Cameroon for Christ. Not politically, for Christ. And I can tell you, many people that have been saved because the sacrifice Charles Wesco made. Because he obeyed, he had faith in God, and, and he listened. He put his life in peril. Yep, he put his children's lives in peril. He put his wife's life in peril, but he obeyed God. About six months after he passed away, our, our church was the sending agency for the missions board for Charles Wesco, and uh, we got a call and said, are you, are you the sending church for Charles Wesco? Said, yeah, we're the missions board. And he said, well, I'm a missionary in Panama. I just want to let you know that the testimony of Charles Wesco is still getting people saved today. I was down at the docks passing out tracts to refugees. People come to Panama all the time because it's a you know, thoroughfare for lots of ships. And a group of 200 Cameroonians got off one of the boats and we were trying to give them tracts. And they said, no, don't get, we don't need them. We don't need them. Give them to somebody else. We all heard about a man named Charles Wesco that came to our country to tell us about Jesus Christ and how he died trying to bring it to us. And so we've all asked Jesus to save us. A group of 200 all at once. Because one man said, I'm going to obey God. I'm going to have faith in God. All the way to his death. Maybe God wants you to, 
to put you through something because of your faith. And if you have faith in God, he's going to take you through to the other side. It's like Paul. I mean, if you read that Hebrews, or, uh, 2 Corinthians 11, Paul went through some awful things because of his faith. But he came through it because of his faith. Getting bitten by a snake and shipwrecked and beaten and whipped and imprisoned over and over and over. What a testimony that is to the lost. What a testimony that is to, to family and loved ones of what God can do if you just have faith. Let me tell you a story, and then I'll be done. I don't know, do I have any hunters in here? I lived in Alaska for six years, and I got to go hunting up there. I hunted moose, and it was a great experience. Two of those years were in a native village, and they do hunting a little differently up there. They, uh, they basically, you go camp out on a mountaintop and for a week straight, essentially, and you, you wake up in the morning, you take binoculars, you look over the valley, and it's a vast valley. You look at rivers and lakes and ponds, and you spot the moose, and then you get dropped off in groups of two, and all day long, slowly work your way out to the mooses and create a circle, and then that circle gets smaller and smaller and smaller until someone sees the moose. Then you get on your radio and you say, hey, I'm going to shoot the moose, and everyone ducks and you shoot the moose. <laughs> so <laughs> we did this two or three days, in a, and it was two days, and nobody got anything. A third day, we woke up and we saw two moose out there, and we got dropped off all along the river in groups of two, and we hiked for about two miles, me and the person I was with, and uh, third day of doing this, both of my thighs and both of my calves started cramping on me and, and locked up. So I'm rolling on the ground in pain, and I told my cousin who was with me, you go ahead, I don't want you to miss out on getting a moose. So I work out the cramps finally, 15, 20 minutes later, and I get up and go in the direction I thought I saw him go. And I walk for another 20, 30 minutes, and, and I get to a group of trees, and I hear something in the trees. So I come back out of the trees, and I get it on my radio, and I say, hey, I'm over here, do you see me? And it took him a while, whoa, where you are, what are you doing? You, you're out of the, you, you went the wrong direction. I said, well, is there a moose here? No, no, you might as well come back. There was no moose there, but yesterday we did see a bear there. So you might as well come back. So, okay, so <laughs> I turned around and started heading back, and I hear off in the distance, bang, and then one more, bang. And so I started to run towards where I heard the gunshots come from, and then I hear on the radio, hey, who's that in a gray sweater? And I wave my arm, yeah, you. The moose is in the trees across the swamp to your left. Run across the swamp. So I ran across the waist-deep swamp and zigzagged through the woods. So I ran back and forth, zigzagging through the woods, and nope, it's not there. It's back at the other trees on the other side of the swamp. So I ran back across the swamp, zigzagged through those woods. Nope, it's back at the swamp again. I got back to the swamp, and sure enough, there's the moose. And by this time, I'm like, <gasps> and I had a 30-30 lever action open sights. And I get on the radar, I'm going to shoot, and I hear it, shoot, shoot, and bang, chick, chick, bang, bang, bang. The moose dropped. Moose got back up. Bang! <laughs> moose dropped. Moose got back up again. Bang! <laughs> moose dropped. Moose got back up again. And in all my running, I had lost my ammo pack. I don't know why. I only had four rounds. I think it could hold six, but I only had four rounds in there. And I click, click. Well, right then, somebody else came out of the woods with a scope and got, boom, and got him in the head. I tell you that, that story is a lot like the process of faith. We get saved at whatever age you're saved at, whether you're saved young or saved old. You have that mountaintop experience of salvation, right? And you get to look over the valley of the possibilities of what you can do for God. God gives you some direction to, to strive towards, towards a goal, and maybe you're with somebody. You have a friend or your spouse or, or somebody that can help you, and, and you're striving towards that goal, and something comes and gets you sidetracked. Something comes and gets you out of the fight. And, and you go off in, in the wrong direction in life, and God has to send you something to scare you back in the right direction, right? And, and you start striving towards that goal for God again, and 
You hear of people having success off in the distance and you get excited and, and instead of uh, walking for God, you start running and striving for God and you're on fire for God. And a lot of times when that happens, something, something else happens at the same time. People see that you're on fire for God and they want to use you for the ministry, right? Maybe some want to abuse you for the ministry. And you go run over here and do this and go help, help out over here and go do this. And, and it seems like you get run ragged and you're exhausted. And, and it seems like nothing you're doing actually accomplishes anything, right? Am I the only one? I'm that, I've, I've felt that many times where I feel like, man, I'm, it, is anything going right for me? Is, is, is <laughs> this, am I planting any seeds? And yet... You see the end goal finally and you take aim and you shoot and it seems like you miss. And you take aim and you shoot and you miss and you shoot and you miss and you shoot and you miss and you never see any results. Charles Wesco certainly didn't see any results. That's how faith works. We're told to, to serve and, and to, to obey and to, to do so many things for God and we never get to, not never, we often don't get to see all the seeds that we've planted along the way. We don't often get to see all the lives that we've touched, all the impact we've had on those around us. We don't get to see a lot of times the result of our faith. Don't, don't be discouraged when you don't see results. Don't be discouraged when it seems like nothing's going right. Don't be discouraged when when you're tired and exhausted trying to serve God. God's word says that one man plants the seed, one man plows the ground, one man waters, mm -hmm. and God gives the increase. And one man plucks the fruit. Just because you're not in the fruit-plucking part of the field does not mean that what you're doing is not worthwhile. does not mean that you're not being used of God, does not mean that your faith is in vain, does not mean that God's not using you. In Matthew 17, the disciples come to Jesus and say, hey, Jesus, why couldn't we cast out this devil? In verse 20 it says, And Jesus saith unto them, Because of your unbelief, for verily I say unto you, if you have faith as a mustard seed, you shall say unto this mountain, Remove hence yonder place, and it shall remove, and nothing shall be impossible unto you. I used to carry around in my Bible a packet of 52 mustard seeds. It was about the size of a quarter, all of them together. And that was to remind me I need to increase my faith. I need to increase my faith. I need to increase my faith. You know, nobody has reached the pinnacle of faith. Nobody's reached and said, Finally, I've done it! I've got enough faith for everything! No, we all lack faith. No, we all need to increase our faith. We all need to strive for faith as a mustard seed. And let the mountains and the roadblocks be moved in your ministry and in your life. I can tell you some places where God has moved mountains in my life. I can tell you some places where God moved mountains in, in the ministry and, and things that I've done. Pray that you can have somewhere in your mind, in your past, where you can say, wow, God moved that mountain. God did the moving, but he did it because I had faith. He did it because of me. He did it to, whether to, to show you how powerful he is, or because he wanted to help you. Well, however, it doesn't matter. God did it because you had faith. And if you don't have those, if you can't point to those, don't be discouraged. You'd be surprised how many mountains have been moved that we don't ever know about. You'd be surprised how many seeds, how many lives you've touched that you don't know about. How do you want to change the world? If you want to change the world for Christ, the only way you're going to do it, the only way you're going to have an impact is through faith. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I pray that, thank you for this time. Thank you, Lord, for given me the opportunity to preach. Lord, I pray that you would help us all to increase our faith. Lord, help us all to look at our lives and realize, Father, where we lack faith, 
Lord, where we need to grow more. Lord, whether we need to tell others about you more. We need to uh, sacrifice more time for you, Father. We need to tell others what our greatest hope is. Lord, maybe we need to learn to walk by faith. Lord, maybe we need to, we're coming up and facing a tribulation ahead and, and we need to increase our faith to get us through it. Father, I pray you'd show us all where we lack faith and help us to grow so that we can shine brighter for you, so we can shine brighter in the lost world around us. I just thank you and praise you and pray all this in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Music's going to start. Just going to take some Salvation, don't put it off. Don't put it off. Don't wait. You never know when that last breath will be. You've heard the gospel. Jesus Christ died for you. You have to, by faith, step and trust that. Maybe you're struggling with that this morning. You don't know what to do. Come and ask. We'll help. We'll share it with you. We'll show you the scripture. Maybe your life, God spoke to your heart about doing something different. Maybe being involved in the ministry here at the church. Maybe God's calling you to preach. Maybe God's calling you to be a missionary. Whatever that is, why would you not just step by faith?